Representative Gervin Hawkins, welcome to the program here. You said that Democrats should compromise Republicans if vouchers become inevitable. Why in the world, a lot of folks are asking, would you ever want to compromise with Texas Republicans? Well, I think, number one, Jason, uh, we're in a situation where we've got to look out for our schools and our school children, okay? And so since there is our leadership, you know, has the majority, and there's times when we've got to create the win-win. We can't continue to get into our corners and say it's my way or the highway. So I'm always about the win-win for the good of the people. What have your Democratic colleagues said? And, and secondly, what is the win-win if you were to compromise? So my colleagues, are, like many other folks, you know, the teacher unions and the teacher groups and all that is saying not only no, but hell no to vouchers, okay? But my, my position is this, is that if indeed uh, we can use this opportunity to reimagine public education by putting more money in the basic allotment, putting more money to support our special ed and other special need kids, to be able to get teacher pay, to be able to create an environment that uplifts everyone. So when we look at vouchers, I also believe that we get in front of it, we can craft that framework, work with our leadership to do that. And I'm just a big believer that we try all different type of angles to be able to help our school age children. So I think that if those things are met, that's something I can look at. Compromise has become a, a dirty word over the years in, in politics. It shouldn't be because that's how most things get done. But I'm curious, what have your constituents said? What have these teacher unions in the San Antonio area said to your uh, compromise comment? Well, I, you know, what's interesting is that most folks publicly are saying no. But after every town hall or meeting I participated in, I've had people to come up to me and say, this makes sense. And notice, you know, what I've said is what if. If this is gonna happen, what what do we need to happen over here? And I'm a big believer that that's what a leader does, resolve issues and, and bring resources to folks to be able to create the win-win. And that's what I love. As a legislator, I think that's important because everybody have their views and there's a left side and a right side. But at the end of the day, we need to come to the middle and that's good governing. Representative, you have a pretty sophisticated uh, background in education. Let me ask you this. On what issue would you not compromise when it comes to education? Well, one of the things I think is so important, and, and let's talk about public education. Public education has our institution of memories, where our historical neighborhoods grew up at, okay, and our local heroes. So we don't want anything that destroys public education. And I'm a big believer that vouchers will not destroy public education. I think if we put the parameters on it, it's going to meet the needs of some of the school-aged children. So for me... You, well, let me ask you this. You said vouchers wouldn't destroy public education. You know, every Democrat in the world is saying absolutely it will. A lot of folks in public education say that. What are the parameters that could be established in your viewpoint that would not destroy public education? Well, first of all, Jason, I would ask them the question, how will it destroy public education? Public education is a, such a big apparatus. There can never be enough private schools to take over public education unless it's 30 or 40 years from now, if that ever occurs, okay? Also, the private school environment is different from public and it's more stricter in many ways. A lot of our parents are not going to deal with the tenets of a public, a private uh, institution. So I think that the reality is you have to ask those people that say it will destroy, ask them how, how could it possibly? And a and lot of folks are saying that the, the way it would destroy public education is less money that would go into public ed. That means that teachers wouldn't get paid, teachers might leave, or districts couldn't do as much as they used to do. Well, tell me this, how does it do that when indeed our state of Texas dollars are built on a per pupil and per service type revenue stream? So let's say for instance, kids do decide to go to private. Do you believe that they're gonna be a major exodus? There's not enough seats in the private infrastructure to make that happen. I've even heard, well, some teachers will quit. I don't think so. If you're in, in teaching for the, for the mission and the goal of educating kids and the salaries are right, I think that teachers will stay. 
I think what we've got to do is enhance public education to be able to make sure that it is the choice of the majority of our folks. Representative, there have been a number of rural Republicans, a couple dozen or so, that have really, you know, put the, the, the nail in this coffin session after session, year after year. What does your gut tell you going into this? Are any of those votes going to change or are rural Republicans again going to vote with Democrats to kill school vouchers? Well, I don't have a clue, but what I believe uh, in, in talking with some of the rural guys is that they don't want things to hurt their schools, right? So what can we do in terms of crafting vouchers so that they don't hurt rules? In most cases, a private school is not even uh, located in rural communities. That's number one. So if we can prohibit where locations are, if we can look at making sure that we fully fund our rural schools, not just a per pupil, because if you have a small population, you get a per pupil amount that's very low, but really look at the salaries an individual came up to me and said in the rural community, teachers are making 33000 How can you live off of that as a professional in today's time? That's why I want to create the win-win. Let's structure an educational system that supports our rural communities, that supports our urban communities, and make sure that students have an opportunity to go to the what best fits them. That's important to me. Do you expect anything to come out of this special session since Republicans on the, you know, in the House and the rural side have stopped it before? You're talking about a compromise is important to at least get something out of this. Do you expect anything at the end of the day after these 30 days have gone through, something will pass? I don't know. And I want to reiterate, I'm not for vouchers. What I'm for is the what if. OK, let's say that if vouchers happen to pass, I'm hoping folks come to the table with a way to improve traditional public education. That's my hope. If everybody stands strong and or I call hold the line and nothing breaks, it won't happen. But what will happen to our schools that need support? What will happen to our kids who need our support, our teachers who need salary increases? So I think we've got to see what the climate is, uh, how willing our leadership is to be able to compromise and, and make some, some decisions that positively impact everybody. Representative vouchers aside, uh, teachers have been asking for a pay raise for years. Districts have been asking for an increase to the basic allotment, how much money they get for each student for a while now. Do you expect either of those issues to actually pass if vouchers do not? Well, I don't know. I mean, if I had my crystal ball, the leadership is saying they want vouchers, okay? Uh, and I don't know what will happen. I think to penalize traditional public and, you know, affect teacher pay and other things like that because we don't get vouchers, I think is the wrong thing to do. But will it happen? Will some of the hearts and minds, you know, be softened? I don't know. But I go into this with an open mind, an open heart, and a willingness to talk to people about addressing their concerns. If there are valid concerns, let's take each one of them and address them so that we don't hurt public education. I'll tell you, Jason, as a legislator, it's important that we look at issues and not deal with sound bites or things that, has, you know, turn people against the others. But let's talk about how we can look at uh, education as a whole and how we can uplift everybody. That's my hope. Representative, final question here. We're about a month away from the constitutional election. There are a number of, of things in the ballot that Texans will see. What are the ones you think Texans should really pay attention to? I think one of them is the child care uh, tax exemption for uh, for uh, entities that host child care centers. Their property tax would be relieved. That allows for them to have additional money to either put in salaries and or to open up uh, classrooms. I think the property tax, no doubt, when you talk about a hundred thousand dollar property tax exemption, that really will help a lot of our older citizens in our older communities. So to me, those are my two top. That I, that I would look at. But I would look at most of all the propositions, mainly because they were passed in a bipartisan manner, which tells me that there's a, a lot of interest in those propositions that we passed with over 100 members. Representative Gervin Hawkins, we appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you.